Welcome to Vet Life Reimagined. Figuring out how to do this introduction for my guest today was a challenge because of the many things he has accomplished. Dr. Robert Gebhardt graduated from vet school in 1967 and has been and continues to be massively influential for the veterinary profession. Dr. Gebhardt is well known as the previous co-owner of one of the largest animal hospitals in the country, West Los Angeles Veterinary Medical Group. This was a three-story animal hospital with elevator and operating rooms that worked around the clock. In 1987, his hospital became the first acquisition of the Veterinary Centers of America, VCA, which later went public. Dr. Gebhardt has always been interested in doing different things. He has co-founded many companies, including Dr. Fossum's Pet Care, which makes pet CBD products. In 2021, he co-founded the National Veterinary Group, which builds hybrid startup practices similar to his West Los Angeles clinic. And one of his recent passion projects is Free Analytics for Veterinary Medicine, where he has created data charts to help practices be more efficient and aware of managing their financials. He has children who are also veterinarians helping to run successful hospitals. He is a visionary and loves the veterinary profession. Now, speaking of adventure, that's what this conversation is. So strap in. His mind is a wonder and he has more energy than I do. We mentioned a couple of past guests in this podcast like Dr. Bob Murtaugh and Jill Clark, who is the founder of Ignite. So I'm so excited to share this whirlwind of a conversation. Let's go. I am so fascinated by, you know, your story, how enthusiastic you are. I love that you, when we were talking earlier in the week, you said you think you're, you're more excited today than you ever have been. Oh, no, no. I am excited. I, I see it coming <laughs> together. You know, when I sold West LA back in 86, you know, what more can we do in practice? You know, we're doing all these things, you know, how can we improve beyond this, what we're doing? So I thought we reached a limit, but by no means did we, you know, it keeps, it keeps growing and keeps improving. And, you know, I, I'm doing that practice in Stockton and, and I want this practice to, to be a diverse and an inclusive practice, you know, so everyone is included. And like I said, you know, there's going to, there's going to be uh, profit sharing and things like that. So that, you know, people know they belong and along with, you know, having our own HR system with using Ignite and what they're doing with the videos and everything really lends itself to that you know so we we can yeah we can improve people's lives you know <clears throat> and, and what better industry to be in than veterinary medicine you know it uh, you know i always say that you know i get to deal with people that like pets as compared to those that don't right yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that says a lot that it says does. a lot in the world right yes absolutely so i you know, I think your your story, your attitude, the, what you've been able to accomplish in building, lar- you know, numerous and large practices, I I kind of want to go back a little bit. And how did you even get your initial interest in veterinary medicine? Well, you know, <clears throat> that's uh, that's a good story. You know, I uh, growing up, you know, I was you know, I'm the typical veterinarian, very introverted. Okay, and so animals were really important to me because I could more readily communicate with them than my parents, you know, (laughs) and uh, as we all are, I think we talk to our dogs and I still do, you know, I got this little Brittany, she's gun shy and, you know, I like to hunt, but God, she's the sweetest dog ever, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and we snuggle and kiss every night, you know, she, we got a routine where she crawls up and I hold her in my arms and we kiss and, you know, and yeah, it's, it's such a pleasure, you know, so, so I always had this affinity for animals and, and communicating with them <clears throat> and so I got interested in in bird hunting in back in Minnesota where I'm from and uh so I raised uh Brittany Spaniels okay so I always had Brittany's they're always named Sassy because that way I don't forget their names so <clears throat> I, I, I think I'm on Sassy 7 or something by now <laughs> and uh but you know <clears throat> I, I really enjoyed that and then one of my bitches uh I uh, had a vaginal discharge and I took it to a local veterinarian that was worked at the University of Minnesota and he had a little clinic in his basement that he worked out of and he sort of mentored me and we went in there and we did the surgery on the animal, you know, <clears throat> with him taking out the uterus and, and that just brings me to the 
Do I, I remember when Jaja came in at two o'clock in the morning one evening, and it was just me and her, and she had a new puppy. I think it was probably 12 weeks old or so, 14 weeks old. And uh, I palpated, it was vomiting and et cetera, not eating. And I palpated the mass uh, in the intestinal tract. And, and uh, so I had her scrub in with me. Okay. So I had her <laughs> put on a mask and a cap, you know, and because it was just me and her, you know, so I, and, and I wanted her to participate in this, you know, and so she was across the table from me and we went in we opened up that abdomen and we got out the, you know, got out that, that the little piece of a rubber toy that, that uh, was in the GI tract there. And, uh, but yeah, yeah, it was, uh, and, and I really believe that the more you involve your clients with your cases, the better. I always thought that you should have an open hospital. And I really believe that the, these hospitals belong to the neighborhood, the community, the clients. And, and so I always had an, you know, an open policy as far as visitation, et cetera. I thought it was very, very important. And, and like that story I was relating to with the Hispanic ladies there in Los Banos, my Central Valley practice is, you know, those, those, those Chihuahua puppies would come with Parvo, you know, they're eight, 10, 12 weeks old, you know, in really bad shape. And, and one of the veterinarians started putting IV catheters and bolusing fluids two, three times a day uh, for them to do at home. And, you know, those animals improve so dramatically because <clears throat> those, those pets are held, you know, and they're fed and they're kept warm, they're kept clean. I mean, we can't do that. We can't dedicate a person. And, and <clears throat> you know, so we, we, we keep a good close eye on, we check it every couple of days and it makes it, they're doing okay. But, you know, it, it, it's amazing what you can do, you know, if you get the clients involved. And, <clears throat> you know, and I, I told you about, the way West LA got built, you know, so I, 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 I bought that practice, like I said, in 1968, I was like five, six months out of school. And I didn't know, know how to do much, except I was very enthusiastic. And, and the practice I was in in Pasadena, it was just a fantastic practice. And, and uh, uh, my partner and I really got along, you know, he, he always wanted to see to, we're, we were big into radiology. We had a 3 MA, 300 MA X-ray machine, all this stuff. And, and he was always interested in seeing a, uh, a, a, a cat with a, a saddle thrombus, you know, and being able to uh, 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 radiograph it and show it radiographically. And so he was on vacation for a week and I had three cats in one week come in with saddle thrombuses, you know, and I could tell it was a, by the third cat, I could tell it was a saddle thrombus because I could hear it walking through the door. You know, <clears throat> you know, the cry that they make in pain is just, you know, heart wrenching. <clears throat> and uh, and so I was able to to, to uh, radiograph them and, and show that saddle thrombus, you know, <laughs> for him. And, and then one time I was uh, I was taking calls for I, I think we had a uh, a. Uh, a CE meeting at the hospital there. I was taking calls for the interns because they were all upstairs. And and one one evening, I had three cardiac tamponades come in. You know, unbelievable, unbelievable. But that's a can-do attitude. That's when you, you know, when people come to your practice, you know, that where you institutionalize it, they know when they have a problem, where to go. So, <clears throat> but... Anyway, I, I get off track, so you got to well, you got to keep me, <laughs> keep me, uh, keep me going in your direction you want. No, so. you, you're it's great. Um, you know, I think that I have heard a lot of stories that are related to that. In that, you know, Jill uh, Jill Clark is a great example. You mentioned her and and her company Ignite when she first really thought about a career in in veterinary medicine was when she as a little girl they had to take a barn cat into the vet for an issue and right. they let her participate as a, a exactly. child she exactly. got to participate and i think that's what really starts to spark the not only the entrance, but that right. I can do it. Like, oh, wow. Like I got to be part of this. I, you know, I yeah, physically no, particip participated. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's, that's so great for encouraging the next generation to come. And then, and then you started to talk about, you know, you went through vet school and very soon after vet school, you bought a practice. And I, 
I'll be bold to say that that's probably not the norm these days of, you know, right, right. veterinarians coming right out of vet school and buying practices. So what was that experience like? It, it sounds like you did have that very can-do attitude, but when did you really start to enjoy the the building, you know, multiple practices and and where did yeah, you start so, to enjoy so, that? So in 1968, I purchased a Cousins Dog and Cat Hospital. Like I say, that's a story in itself. Dr. Cousins was on the board of Crocker National Bank, okay? So, you know, it just opens your eyes to what veterinarians could do and how important they are in communities. And, and his clients were Bing Crosby and, you know, Clark Gable, and all those uh, old time actors and actresses that uh, that liked the outdoors and liked to hunt, et cetera. And so I, I drove by that practice and there was a large neon sign. I'll never forget it all rusted out on top of the building. I mean, large neon sign, you know, it was probably 20 feet high and you could see it from Wilshire Boulevard there in West Los Angeles. So, and, uh, uh, and so I walked into the practice. I, I was going to drive by it because it really didn't fit, you know, what, what I was looking for. And uh, my wife at the time said, uh, Mary said, you know, and take a well, what you know, you drove in a, drove all this way. And as I, I said, I couldn't get on the freeway. So I drove Sunset Boulevard all the way down to West Los Angeles, which is a long drive. <clears throat> but you drive through Beverly Hills and Bel Air, you know, and you're in Santa Monica, you're in West LA. <clears throat> and so I walked into that practice and there was a tree growing through the window and had that old institutional green color, you know, that you saw in army barracks and things, you know. <clears throat> and uh and 30 veterinarians had walked through the practice and no one wanted it. Uh, and uh, the receptionist was keeping it together. The veterinarians were dead for six months. So the wind widow owned the practice. And I was able to, so I, I went and looked at the card files and the Sinatra's clients and the Gabor's clients, just had incredible clientele. And I had nothing to lose, you know? I didn't have any money. I had two kids, you know? Uh, I had to hock my stereo to get my wife out of the hospital, you know? So, you know, I was pretty poor. And, uh, but I said, you know, so I, I was able to purchase that practice for 17,000, you know, at the time there, when I was in Pasadena, I was one of the highest paid veterinarians out of Minnesota at the time, which was a thousand dollars a month. Okay. Now, as you know, it's a thousand dollars a day, you know, and, and, uh, so, so I, uh, so I, I purchased the practice for 17,000 and I got an option to buy. And, you know, I was always interested in growing your practice and, 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 and excelling and doing well. You know, so I had a 300 MA extra machine. <clears throat> UCLA was right next to me. So there was, there was veterinary stuff at UCLA. So I used to bring cases there. You know, and I, I had a philosophy that the only time I refer to cases when I took the case to that practice so that I could learn, so that I could cut you know, with the Ray White camps of the world, you know, the backs, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, uh, Steve Energer, you know, I brought in, in fact, in his book is a, uh, is in one of his books is a uh, radiograph of uh, 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 a bulldog with tracheal hypoplasia <clears throat> that he, he put in this text. So I got to know Steve quite well. <clears throat> and, uh, uh and he ended up practicing right next door. So he was 100 yards away from me. So we had these two big, huge practices in LA that became West LA, you know, and he was, he was in the practice. So I always took the cases with me. And, and how I built that practice is one is I made it a walk-in practice. And, and I did that because I learned in that area that there's a lot of veterinary hospitals, probably eight of them, right on, within two blocks on Sepulveda Boulevard. And none of the veterinarians spoke to each other. They didn't get along because they broke off from each other and started their own practices. So I said, you know, I don't want to associate my name to to uh, to, uh, to with with a client. You know, I wanted to come to the hospital uh, because of the quality of care <clears throat> that we produce and provide. And uh, and so <clears throat> I ended up. Uh, 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 working with breeders, okay, a lot. And as I said, you know, I spoke to the breed clubs up and down the coast. Uh, and uh, I, I brought a dog with me, a, a 12 pound little terrier, and I would mask it down <clears throat> with halothane, I think at the time, intubate it, 
you know, hook it up to the EKG and do all these things. So the breeders were deathly scared of anesthesia and rightly so, because what we did was we, we would titrate uh, uh, a serotol or pentothal, you know, IV. And that's how we did most of our surgeries until, you know, we had, uh, we had uh, 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 inhalation anesthetics again. So I, I bring this dog with me and, and all machines initially had nitrous oxide on them just because, you know, I, I like stretching the boundaries and things. And, and so I worked with them and because I was interested in orthopedics, I, uh, and surgery, I, uh, I showed a great Dane, you know, <laughs> and so, and, and so I had all these pain points, you know, and I speak on lamenesses and all this stuff. And they're just fantastic lines. They would bring me cases in like wiggle wobbles, you know, and, uh, Dila Hunter just came out with this paper, I think about that time on, on, uh, on instability, cervical instability. And then uh, the Lhasa and the Shih Tzu's bringer and breeders would bring me in. They're water drinkers, you know. And I, I remember calling Don Lowe and Carl Osborne back in Minnesota. I said, geez, what are these water drinkers? And I say, why didn't you tell me about this? And he said, well, how many Lhasa's and Shih Tzu's did we ever see in Minnesota? <laughs> we didn't see any. I think maybe there was one. And so they didn't see the cases. And so, you know, so seeing disease and being able to reproduce some of these familial genetic diseases makes great models for human medicine too. And, and so the Schnauzer Club had a problem with systolis, and so they bred uh, a dam and a sire. And uh, I took those six puckies, flew them back to Minnesota. And, and Jeff Klausner, I think he did his master's or PhD on them. All six of those pups came down with bladder stones, with systolis obviously. And that's how that NIH project, I mean, that huge, huge, huge syphilis project got started at Minnesota. And millions of syphilis went through there. So they got all these NIH grants. And that was off of $10,000 that the Schnauzer Club in LA raised, you know, oh, wow. to produce all that. <clears throat> you know, and then I, I shipped off a couple of losses uh, to Georgia for, to Del Finco and, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I, I had my mentors, you know, I had uh, Carl and, and uh, Don. And what was great about this practice, the practice grew to be large enough that I could put on our own CE, our own kitchen education. So I was able to fly, you know, like Carl, I spent two weeks in, with him in the Sierras, you know, picking his brain. So we vacationed together and his family and I drove him all over the Sierras. I had a place up at Mammoth. We spent some time up there. And, and so I got these one-on-one -on -one relationships with these people. I can remember Don Lowe flew down from Davis. So, so Don was a head of clinics of Minnesota, Colorado, and uh, Davis, just an icon. That guy, it was unbelievable. He could percuss like no one you've ever seen. I mean, he could tell the, where the fluid line was, you know, <laughs> and it was just, just amazing, his art of physical exams, you know, and, and no one was better than him. And, and so I had this great mentorship, but I was able to fly these people in, you know, so I flew Don in to see Jaja about her dog, you know, <laughs> and, and I, I flew Jaja back to Minnesota and uh, she brought her Lhasa back there. It had a problem. I, I could diagnose it. You have to realize in L.A., fleas were just, you know, fleas would pick up an animal and take them away. You know, they were so bad. And uh, so uh, her her dog had uh, had elevations in the liver enzymes. It had a hepatopathy. And, and I biopsy. It didn't have these uh, eosinophic occlusion bodies. No one knew what they were. Sent it back to Minnesota. And uh, and they they diagnosed it, you know. They well, they tried to work it up. They I I don't think they ever diagnosed it, but I, what I concluded it was a steroid hepatopathy that I was seeing producing these ESA because we used a ton of steroids. I mean, you had to. You didn't have a choice. Those animals suffered so much. The only relief they got from scratching was you know was a cortisone injection. And uh, so <clears throat> anyway, yeah. So <laughs> I sent Joshua back there. And uh, and that was a big thing in Minnesota, obviously. And when she left, they were clapping. You know, when she walked out the door, I couldn't believe it. It was so cute, you know. And uh, 
and I went back for my 50th reunion and they had a booklet there and there was a picture of Jaja. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell them that I referred her, you know, and uh, but any of it, it was just, you know, it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal practice. It kept growing and working with the breeders and that really, really, you know, uh, helped us tremendously. We saw, you know, a ton of, and, and then, <clears throat> so I, I sold that, that option to buy that I got when I bought that practice to Hillcrest Cadillac at Beverly Hills, and they gave me a hundred thousand, which is probably a million a day. So I was take I was able to take and get out of the village because I only have one parking spot, and I went down to Sepulveda Boulevard, where all the other hospital was, and there I rented a five thousand square foot facility. I, I think it was twenty five dollars a square foot for fifty years. And when I moved out of there, I was actually able to sell the lease. It was so valuable, you know, at that price. <clears throat> and uh, so, and then when I did that, I partnered with uh, Marty Dennis. Marty Dennis, is a, as I talked about previously, was a was a Bronx veterinarian. Uh, he was about 5'8", and he had this big, big red afro. I mean, huge red afro. And, and he... He got started with Ringland Brothers coming to the Bronx there, coming to Brooklyn, you know, and and uh, he was sort of uh, 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 mentored by the Ringland Brothers uh, veterinary and exotic animal. And so Marty loved exotic animals and he was phenomenal. Like I said, he used to be a rodeo clown, so you could see him popping in and out of barrels, you know, <laughs> and he, he was just he was just tremendous. And so I had all these veterinarians from the LA Zoo, you know, Bob Franz and John Bernstein. Just iconic individuals, just amazing, amazing veterinarians. And they did, uh, like I said, we did Dr. Tari, General Ben, Siegfried and Roy, Michael Jackson, uh, Marine World. Uh, you know, it was just, uh, I remember Tippy Hedren coming in when these guys were gone and she had 50 lines, they all had ringworm. And so, you know, yeah, the big, big problem, you know, trying to, trying to solve it. Anyway, it was just so, so much fun, you know. We used to, uh, elephants from Indonesia used to come and uh, baby elephants to get uh, climatized, et cetera, and get wormed, et cetera, for insurance purposes. So we'd, we'd exercise the elephants around the block. So you can imagine in the middle of the city, we were walking baby elephants around. So it caught a lot of attention, you know? And I, I remember a client coming to me and say, you know, geez, doc, we come to you when we have, you know, when we have major problems and, you know, and I, I always try to push the boundaries, you know, like I had image intensifiers and, you know, just the latest with everything, you know, and uh, I used to fly, you know, Bob Pensinger, who was one of the original cardiologists, uh, grandfathered in, uh, I used to fly him into, uh, into, uh, into LA. In fact, I, I remember a client uh, when I was up in the village had stiffed me on a, 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 I think it was a Yorkie with heart failure. <clears throat> she stiffed me with the bill. And I, and, and I really pursued, you know, I, I would let clients, clients charge, but boy, I would pursue them uh, in small claims court if they didn't pay me. And so I, I got a, I got a judgment against her and I actually uh, uh, pulled her car out of the parking garage in Wilshire Boulevard <laughs> so, and, uh, until she paid me. So, it, it, you know, but, but yeah, so, you know, it, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, from, from there, so I was on West LA and Marty was part of that practice and all these veterinarians. And then, uh, like I said, we didn't have any parking. So I moved the practice down the street. And at one time we owned three practices. We had a cat practice within, within two blocks. So on the next block where, uh, uh Steve Energy ended up, there was a practice that I bought that I tore down and built a three-story two elevator hospital, you know, I went from 5,000 square feet, which everyone thought I was crazy, to 15,000 square feet. <clears throat> and I, I remember Ross Clark and Dennis Henson, who Jill spoke about that there were they're his mentors. So, you know, and uh, so I moved that practice. But in 1978, I had contracted with two software engineers from TRW, uh, from the, you know, the rocket lab there. And I think SpaceX is in that space now. And and uh, to to computerize West Los Angeles, and and I picked a system uh, called an Alpha Micro. I went to Hawaii for a week and studied uh, studied computers and 
and try to learn about them. And, and there wasn't much of a choice. I think there was Ohio Scientific and Alpha Micro in a micro form that you could afford. That wasn't, there weren't many computers, you know, or mainframes. So I had, my computer was a hard drive, hard disk drive where everyone else in the industry at that time were using floppies. And so we programmed that out. And, and uh, I mean that, and every time I solved a problem and, and that's why I like computers in software because I could solve problems once and for all, you know? And uh, so th this was a really, really great, great uh, system. And, and people still talk about it today, how stable it was, you know, you never had to reboot it. And, uh, and, it was, and I was built it for cash control because uh, getting embezzled is a common problem. And so it was built for cash control. So I ended up having five practices in West LA and all of them were on that computer system, you know, so and that started with the networking of computers. And, uh, and, and then, then I sold that practice in after uh, eight, 18, 19 years to VCA. So Bob Anton called me, I think it was in March and, and, uh, and, and I built the practice because, you know, I, I didn't want to get stuck, you know, and I couldn't sell the practice where I was at because there's no parking. So I built this new, new practice, three stories with parking underneath so I could end up selling it. And so Bob called me a couple of years being in that new practice. He said, you know, we want to buy your practice. And, uh, and so he courted me for, you know, multiple, multiple meetings. I met with Smith, Smith Mark Barty and, you know, and, and tried to understand what he was trying to accomplish. And we agreed and we sold the practice to Bob Art and Neil. And that was January 31st, 1986. And, uh, and they had 300,000 in the pocket. That's all the money they had, you know, and I didn't ask them for financials. You know, I, I really liked Bob and I trusted him. And, and, and rightly so. I mean, he did a fantastic job. You know, and we were approached multiple times by many individuals to go public or do something. But, you know, I know my limitations and, and, and I, I know how to build a practice and grow a practice and take care of clients and take care of the patients, et cetera, and, and manage chaos. I love managing chaos. You know, it started an internship so we could have 24 hour care that we could afford. And it was an iconic internship. We'd see 150, 200 clients, uh, uh, 150, 200 applications uh, a year, you know, for that internship. So it was a really important part of the practice and, and something I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed mentoring and see these young people. And, you know, like I said, Todd Tams was, a, was an intern. Uh, he left a practice, a jury practice in Vermont and flew to LA and, and was an internship. Bob Murtog. Uh, 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 you know, Matt Miller, you know, Terry, Terry Foster, we turned down. I think she went to, she decided on Santa Cruz rather than our practice, unfortunately, you know. Hey, thank you for watching Vet Life Reimagined. This is still a growing channel on YouTube. So liking the video, subscribing to the channel, leaving comments and sharing the show all go a long, long way right now. And it is all seen and appreciated. I still have over 40 guests and many more videos on the channel that you can go back and listen to, like Justine Lee, i.e. Vet Girl, Dr. Brent Mayab, Alyssa Mages, Rob Trimble, Megan Parks, and many more. I've created plenty playlist for you so you can dive in. You can listen to veterinary technicians, veterinarians, veterinary students. You could discover all of that and more if you go to the main page of the Vet Life Reimagined YouTube channel. The link is down below if you need it. Now back to the conversation. So Ter Terry and I have a business. I didn't tell you that. Uh, you haven't but, talked about it, no. No. So Terry and I have a CBD business, you know, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and it, it, CBD is incredible. You know, I've had scalp psoriasis all my life, and, and you know, for for the last fifty some years, getting injections beneath my scalp to to calm it down, and it never went away. I was always always impressed until I started on CBD. It's gone. You know, I am such a big believer. You know, in the cases and the testimonials. So now uh, we're branching out into, uh, uh, we have a product called Cognicaps, okay, which is a, uh, for cognitive disease, canine cognitive disease, uh, 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 
uh, we, we have a neurologist out of, out of Cornell that put this, uh, this product together for us using uh, herbs okay you know and I was always I was, I was down look look down at that you know on uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the alternative market basically which I shouldn't have I should have had an open mind okay and uh, <clears throat> but I've learned through time you know <laughs> you know <laughs> that, that those, those uh, indigenous people they knew what was going on you know and like I said you know today I take I take shrooms I take mushrooms because I want to preserve my brain you know and it's amazing when you do how you can visualize things you know that spreadsheet I showed you the fee analytics spreadsheet has over 1.2 million cells in that spreadsheet <laughs> to do that to do that fee analytics I, I think we could cut it down you know there's a bunch of extraneous stuff in there and uh, <clears throat> but you know it took me two years to do basically but you know it was a labor of love and uh but so any of that uh, I sold it to to Bob and Art, and then I moved to Reading because I like to fish. I like to fly fish, and uh, and I like I like bird hunting. I, I love being out with my dog and and just spending time with her or with them. And uh, it, it's just so such a wonderful bonding that you have. And all I can say is pheasants must stink a lot because these dogs can pick them up from, you know, a hundred yards away. It's just amazing, amazing. This, and, and the relationship that you have with a hunting dog is so, so, so incredible. You know, you're so close to each other and you hunt for the dog. I don't hunt for myself. I hunt for the dog because I love to watch her, you know, love to watch <laughs> her. So, but in any event, so I'm getting off track here. So you got to keep me in, in line because, you know, I, I, I lose track at my age. A lot of times I'm, I'm pretty forgetful, actually. So anyway. you've also you you've done a lot. You're doing a lot. It, it's you know, I, I think that's that's normal. Um, well, you you started. I, I just love how how well you have built relationships from clients to colleagues. I, I loved hearing about, you know, vacationing together with colleagues, you know, intentionally going to them, learning from them, um, your your eagerness to learn, your your interest in building relationships also in helping the next generation as well. Because when you we talked earlier this week, you mentioned that the internship program was one of the your favorite things that you did in in that practice because you you like teaching and mentoring and helping the next generation and that's it's something you've said a couple of times that it's it's about the next generation now for you you want to give back so with that in mind what are some pieces of advice that you would like to to share well you know uh, you know I, I i revived this fee analytics i did 2009 and that's really taken off that that'll be a huge huge contribution to this profession to finally make sense of fees and how they come about and be able to be able to uh adjust them to suit the needs of the client you know <clears throat> so that's a big thing but the other thing i'm doing is there's a practice andy fry is a boarded surgeon that worked for me at west la and uh he had a practice there in uh in uh, stockton and it's a 12,000 square foot practice right on the I-5 freeway. So I have an opportunity with Andy to go in there and, uh, and because uh, he, he only uses it three, four days a week. He basically does TPLOs and total hips and, and really restricts himself to that. And he, he's plenty busy doing that. And the pro practice is profitable, but he wants to retire. So I'm going to go in and basically just lease the facility. And this facility will be owned by the veterinarians, you know, I'll have probably 20% of the practice. I, I have three children that are veterinarians. I have a daughter-in-law that's a veterinarian, a son, two sons that are veterinarians. And uh, so they'll be part of those that practice eventually at some point in time. They're up in the, the Chico practice. That's the last practice I did was I merged five practices in Chico and built a 14,000 square foot facility and uh, 24 hours a day hybrid uh, with boarded uh, surgeon internist and that. I like the small communities uh, because, like I said, I think it's so important to institutionalize your practice. And so people know where you're at in case they have problems. And if they've been there once, they're going to remember how to get there. You know, so I think that's important to develop that relationship. And, and, and 
having a walk-in or urgent care practice is, it was important to me because I had the interns. Okay. And so my interns saw so many, you know, John Ensign is someone that you should interview also. John Ensign is, you know, John? I don't know. No. no, John is a, was a Senator from Nevada. He's oh. a, he's was an intern of mine. He showed up in a, in a Porsche. Okay. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and John, father uh owned casinos mandalay bay you know and uh john just tremendous tremendous he always talks about one night where they saw i don't know 200 clients or something you know and, and three of them and because it was just them you know mm -hmm. it's just the interns on you know and they they loved it they ate it up you know <laughs> and it got to the point i would see a case and and, and, you know, these kids, you got to realize they're the best coming out of these schools. I mean, they were so much brighter than me, you know. So <laughs> I'd always write on the chart, you know, hospitalize, uh, diagnose, treat, and release, you know, <laughs> and, uh, because they would do whatever they wanted to do. They'd call up the clients. They'd get more history. You know, they were just fantastic. <laughs> and so I, I enjoyed them so, so much. So in this practice, I want to make this practice like that. I want to make it inclusive. Okay, practice. I want it to be diverse. Uh, I want young veterinarians to be mentored and have partnerships. Uh, I, I I talked to Sal Rolo there at uh, Antec and uh, about putting a stat lab in. I had stat lab in the practice I went to in Reading, and you know having an in-house lab stat lab really really tremendous. You know, incredible. Uh, and uh, so getting results right away on these panels of that, you can do so, so much more. And uh, so a stat lab would be great. Uh, there's uh, there's Keratin College. I think they have 300 RBT students. I want to rotate them through there. So I, I, and I want to provide to the staff also a, a profit sharing, you know, so they can actually, and, and this is why I'm interested in what Jill's doing. You know, I did a, and I've done so many different things, you know, <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, I love my profession. I can't get enough of it. And just, it's just, it's just the most amazing, pleasurable thing that you, you could ever be or ever be part of. I mean, such a blessing. You know, I always say that my hospital is my temple. That's my church. I do God's work. And we do as veterinarians, we do God's work, you know, it, it is so important that connection. You know, I, I presume some point in time we'll be able to talk to our dogs and, you know, <laughs> maybe carry on a conversation with the cats and things like that. But uh, anyway, so I, I want to make this practice a, a teaching facility. And <clears throat> what I want to do is transfers. So I want to support all the neighboring practices because I know what it's like to be in small practices. It's very difficult you know, to do that type of quality care, you know, and so I had some small practices and, and I want to be able to support those practices with transfers. So, you know, I'm talking to Steve May, who, you know, you know, Steve had a chauffeur service, you know, he had limousines that would pick up cases for me at West LA, you know, and bring them to the hospital. And uh, so I, I reached out to Steve and said, geez, you know, let's do a transfer service. Let's get three or four vans because I'm right on the I-5 freeway. So, I can have signage up and down that freeway uh, and uh, on top of the building, you know, it's right there. So it's just a perfect spot for me to do something like that. And so I can go down the I-5 corridor to those small towns and to the 99 corridor or up to Sacramento, San Francisco's uh, an hour west of me. So, you know, we, we're, we'd be able to do some really, really fantastic work, you know. Uh, I want to get a hyperbaric chamber. You know, I got a good friend, Bob Whitman, who uh, he's got a, all the credentials, you know, and uh, and uh, so we talk, you know, hyperbaric chamber, I think would be really, really interesting. We see a lot of snake bites, you know, mm -hmm. I think the Chico practice would see 100, 150, you know, uh, we have rattlesnakes right, right in our city parks, you know, so, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing, you know, veterinary medicine is such a fulfilling, fulfilling profession. You know, and, and I think it helps, you know, you got to know your boundaries. OK, and I know my boundaries, you know, one is I don't like appointments. OK, and, and I don't want to make that connection. You know, some some clients are very toxic. They have a lot of issues and they transfer their problems to you. And that's what hurts these younger veterinarians because they take it personally. You know, and it's just such a shame. 
and when you don't have that appointment system, you get a little bit of uh, of uh, space, okay, so to speak, you know, from them. And uh, so, so that's what I want to do with that practice. I want to make it a a show place. I want to, you know, I like software. I want to try all these apps. You know, I want uh, uh, Antex coming out with their own, own in-house equipment. I want to have Heska, Antex you know, IDEX equipment. So these RVTs can learn, you know, uh, and they can be part of that practice. Uh, and uh, because that's a big problem. I was back at the at Minnesota talking to the Dean. She's our biggest problem with staff, you know, mm -hmm. the veterinarians are a problem, but the staff is a bigger problem. We just can't entice them, you know, and that's why that fee analytics is important because you can see what the RVT lends to a practice, you know, and what they could do and what you can do for them. You know, uh, the productivity of veterinarians is about 50%, you know, uh, and uh, so we, we got a lot of room. I mean, if we can increase that to 60 or 70%, we can, we can pay the technicians more, the doctors will get rewarded more. And that's why fees are important. You don't update your fees, the veterinarians don't get a raise because most of them are on production, you know? And so you got to do that. You know, you got to stay on top of it. And, and so with this, I made it so that it was uh, so so it would require very little work or effort. You know, you put in the EBITDA or the dollar amount that you want, or maybe you want to keep the, the fees flat. Maybe you want to change and lower some fees to entice the clients, you know, like your wellness fees or diagnostic fees. You know, we, we, we price ourselves out of everything like pathology. I mean, you got to charge five, six hundred dollars for pathology. I mean, that's ridiculous. So you don't you you, you don't learn. Okay, if you don't do pathology, you know, if you don't do postmortems, you don't know what you're doing, you know, so, yeah, anyway, so it's been a good ride. Uh, I'm not finished. I'm, I'm very healthy. Uh, and uh, so, and I'm bored to death. So I got to keep going. So, <laughs> uh, you know, there's just so much more I could do, you know, and it's just, uh, it's pretty exciting. And it's really nice that I have three children because we talk veterinary medicine all the time, you know, and I'm going to have to go back and get caught up if I'm going to start this practice and get up to date with everything because uh, I haven't practiced for probably seven years, you know, and so that that's a long downtime and a lot of changes have occurred, you know, obviously, but yeah, anyway, so it's been just a f fantastic uh, time that I've had and, uh, and I'm not finished. I got things I want to get accomplished and, and like I say, I, I, I like the Megan Sprinkle. So are you related to Ted Sprinkle? I know this name. Oh, is that the the one who does like consumer insights and? He, well, he did pet partners and that, you know. Oh, He's, oh he... that no, but funny story. Um, I got invited to do a talk at one of the their conferences, and I knew nothing. This is bad on me. I should have researched the company. I should have done right. You, you know that, that that wasn't on me. But I was on the bus being taken from the airport, and someone asked me, "Did you know that the last name of Sprinkle is you know the owner?" of this <laughs> hospital. I was like, no. And then unrelated later in, someone came up to me and said, you know, you kind of look like the, the founders, um, like you could be related. And I was like, nope, I don't think so. <laughs> so no, but um, that is kind of a, a weird coincidence because Sprinkle yeah. is not the most common name. Right. Now, <laughs> do, do you have another veterinarian in your family? No. Besides you? No, just, just you. Okay, cool. So yeah. yeah, it's interesting, you know. I, you know, it, we we talked about uh, uh, 3D printing. You know, yes. that's going to be a big thing, and I could see 3D printing in you know in veterinary hospitals, especially specialty centers. You know, like I say, if you want to do a, uh, a tracheal uh, stent, you know, you could produce that. If you wanted to model a fracture to better understand how to approach it, uh, you know. Uh, like Andy's doing a, uh, he's doing a, a skipper key or something, a uh, total hip on one. And uh, they could model that, you know, the small dogs are, are harder, you know, they, they less likely to do them. And, uh, but then, you know, so much you could do with it. So I could see where 3D printing would be so, so helpful, you know, in veterinary medicine, you know, and, I yeah. I agree with you. I think we're in exciting times in, in the world, especially in veterinary medicine. I think it is a, a very special place to be. That's why I love having these conversations. And, and so I, I'll have a couple of things because I want to be able to get you to your next call. One, okay. the, I, 
your system that you're, you're having that people will be able to know how to charge and it's so simple and all this work you've done, where can we send people to learn more and be ready? Yeah, to so what we'll be doing is we'll be uh, putting a website together. So it's okay. a little premature. We had a great call from Kim Fish with, uh, with AHA and uh, she works now with Chewy. Chewy purchased the analytic business of AHA. They're very, very interested with what we're doing, and we're probably going to work with AHA on this. And that'll give us, it'll be a separate entity that'll give us credibility. <clears throat> the other thing I want to do is I want to do an HR system. I think I told you that. And I want to use Jill's uh, software in that. So I envision, you know, <clears throat> and I've had some very large practices. The last one, Chico had over 100 veterinarians there, or 100 uh, excuse, excuse me, employees and, and 20 veterinarians. But uh, yeah, so I want to do an HR system, and we uh, and I have scheduling software that I can add to that. Okay, <clears throat> because the, the most important part of the financials in a veterinary hospital is labor. You know, it's forty-five to sixty percent of what your cost is labor. We do very, very poor job with that labor and those technicians. So I want to build a build a reward system in to the practice. I want it to be uh, transparent. So they could see how the practice is doing, how much their profit sharing would be. I want Jill's videos to be built into it so that we have, so that we have training built in and levels of competency and pay on those levels and that. So as much we could do with a employee and vet centric HR system. And I want to put fee analytics within that too. And I want Jill to run it. You know, I don't want to run another business. You know, I, I, the computer business, we had about 500 practices, I think. And I did all the large ones, Ordell and Berwyn, University of Georgia, I think Michigan State, maybe. So, so I knew all this. I did Ross Clark's practice and Dennis Henson's practice that Jill talked about, her mentors, you know. Mm -hmm. So they were good friends of mine. And I remember Ross, uh, they had a meeting in LA and I think they were called the Eagles, the Eagle Group or something. It, it started with uh, Gary Burge and Ross Clark. You know, they put that National Pet Care Centers together that Jill was part of. I think they had 80 practices that they sold to VCA. But I, I remember Ross coming into the practice there and just shaking and says, how are you going to pay for this? You know, <laughs> and, uh, and we did. And, uh, you know, it, it, we, we didn't make a fortune or anything like that. You know, if we hung on for a while longer. But, you know, L.A. wasn't my thing. I like to... You know, go fishing, like I say, you can't do anything spontaneously in Los Angeles. You know, you got to plan for it. And so you end up flying to, you know, Alaska or Christmas Islands to go fishing or, you know, I've been to Cuba four times, you know, but uh, yeah. So, yeah, so that's, that's what I want to do. I want to do that HR system with Jill, you know, so that I, I want to make certain that employees are taken care of, you know, for too long, they sacrificed on our behalf. You know, that, that's just wrong. And, and it's about time. And now with the profession reaching the heights it has, and the fees are probably higher than they need to be, uh, we can do a lot more with these people. And, and we have to do that to solve our problem, you know, of, of, uh, of lack of veterinarians. You know, we got to elevate these individuals in the practice. So, and uh, I think, uh, I think, using Jill's, uh, her videos of that would be really, really uh, extremely helpful for that. So, yeah. Well, you keep cool. me updated and I'll keep everybody else updated and we'll make right, sure that right. when it's available, we'll send people your way. And cool. so your, your last question is, you've talked a lot about things that you're, you're grateful for, but if you had to kind of sum it up, what is one thing that you are most grateful for? Uh, boy, I tell you the one thing I'm most grateful for is probably probably the, being involved with animals you know I'm really really grateful for that relationship you know it does psychologically it helps people so so much you know and you see it all the time in practice you know you know I saw it with Jasha you know with tears in her eyes you know you know, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's it's that relationship is so, so important. So I think that's the best thing, you know, having that puppy, you know, having those dogs when I was a kid was was the best thing. So, you know, and, and as as I said, you know, veterinarians are, are, are fragile, you know, because they have so much empathy, 
you know they care so much you know and, and that 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 at times can be you know cause some difficulties cause some problems especially like Julia says if you don't know your boundaries you gotta say be able to say no you know and you know so I, I could tell you stories that you know in fact I'll tell you a story so and so in in the it was about 1972 I had a client come in with a cockatiel and so you know it's a little six inch high bird you know and the was doing poorly the feathers were ruffled it wasn't eating and it was about four o'clock in the evening i said you know what we're going to do is we're going to hospitalize your bird and we're going to take blood and we're going to get some radiographs and try to diagnose what's happening here with your bird so <clears throat> what i did was i put the bird in the middle cage with a perch and a heat lamp on it and food and water and bedding got it all set up for the night okay came back the next morning and there was the bird, happy as a lark, on the perch, hopping up and down, chirping away, singing, singing, life is great, life is wonderful, but it was nude, did not have a feather, no facial feathers, no tail feathers, nothing. It was like a plucked chicken <laughs> singing and dancing up and out of the perch. And I said, what the heck? And down below was a spider monkey with a all the feathers in the spider monkey's cage and so that spider monkey went up that bird got on his finger went down i love you i love you not i love you i love you not till all the feathers are gone and then put the bird back up into the cage true story how does that happen <laughs> <laughs> the bird was back up in the cage you at know? least he was happy um... <laughs> uh, yeah yeah oh just i mean just amazing amazing things you know Oh, yeah. So that. anyway, it's been a lot of fun. So anyway, I'll leave you at that, Megan. So we'll talk some more. Okay. That's wonderful. Yes, okay. absolutely. Take care. Okay. We'll talk Thanks soon. so much. Bye. Uh -huh. This has been the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. Whether you are listening or watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure you are subscribed to catch all these amazing people in our profession. Also, send this episode to someone you think who would appreciate it. Have a recommendation for someone who would be a good guest? Please reach out on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. There aren't that many Dr. Sprinkles. Until next time, vet lifers.